This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marion Brown, Toronto, Canada. The Four Million by O. Henry, Chapter 18, The Caliph, Cupid, and the Clock. Prince Michael of the electorate of Valuluna sat on his favorite bench in the park. The coolness of the September night quickened the life in him like a rare tonic wine. The benches were not filled, for park loungers, with their stagnant blood, are prompt to detect and fly home from the crispness of early autumn. The moon was just clearing the roofs of the range of dwellings that bounded the quadrangle on the east. Children laughed and played about the fine sprayed fountain. In the shadowed spots, fawns and hamadryads wooed, unconscious of the gaze of mortal eyes. A hand organ, Philomel by the grace of our stage carpenter, Fancy, fluted and droned in a side street. Around the enchanted boundaries of the little park, streetcars spat and mewed, and the stilted trains roared like tigers and lions prowling for a place to enter and above the trees shone the great, round, shining face of an illuminated clock in the tower of an antique public building. Prince Michael's shoes were wrecked far beyond the skill of the carefulest cobbler. The ragman would have declined any negotiations concerning his clothes. The two-week stubble on his face was grey and brown and red and greenish-yellow, as if it had been made up from individual contributions from the chorus of a musical comedy. No man existed who had money enough to wear so bad a hat as his. Prince Michael sat on his favorite bench and smiled. It was a diverting thought to him that he was wealthy enough to buy every one of those close-ranged, bulky, window-lit mansions that faced him, if he chose. He could have matched gold— equipages, jewels, art treasures, estates, and acres with any Croesus in this proud city of Manhattan, and scarcely have entered upon the bulk of his holdings. He could have sat at table with reigning sovereigns, the social world, the world of art, the fellowship of the elect, adulation, imitation, the homage of the fairest, honors from the highest, praise from the wisest, Flattery, esteem, credit, pleasure, fame, all the honey of life was waiting in the comb in the hive of the world for Prince Michael of the electorate of Vallaluna, whenever he might choose to take it. But his choice was to sit in rags and dinginess on a bench in a park, for he had tasted of the fruit of the tree of life, and finding it bitter in his mouth, had stepped out of Eden for a time to seek distraction close to the unarmored, beating heart of the world. These thoughts strayed dreamily through the mind of Prince Michael. As he smiled under the stubble of his polychromatic beard, lounging thus, clad as the poorest of mendicants in the parks, he loved to study humanity. He found in altruism more pleasure than his riches, his station, and all the grosser sweets of life had given him. It was his chief solace and satisfaction to alleviate individual distress, to confer favors upon worthy ones who had need of succor, to dazzle unfortunates by unexpected and bewildering gifts of truly royal magnificence, bestowed, however, with wisdom and judiciousness. And as Prince Michael's eye rested upon the glowing face of the great clock in the tower, his smile, altruistic as it was, became slightly tinged with contempt. Big thoughts were the prince's, and it was always with a shake of his head that he considered the subjugation of the world to the arbitrary measures of time. The comings and goings of people in hurry and dread, controlled by the little metal moving hands of a clock, always made him sad. By and by came a young man in evening clothes and sat upon the third bench from the prince. For half an hour he smoked cigars with nervous haste. Then he fell to watching the face of the illuminated clock above the trees. His perturbation was evident, and the prince noted in sorrow 
that its cause was connected in some manner with the slowly moving hands of the timepiece. His Highness arose and went to the young man's bench. "'I beg your pardon for addressing you,' he said, "'but I perceive that you are disturbed in mind. "'If it may serve to mitigate the liberty I have taken, "'I will add that I am Prince Michael, "'heir to the throne of the electorate of Valleluna. "'I appear incognito, of course, "'as you may gather from my appearance. "'It is a fancy of mine to render aid to others "'whom I think worthy of it. "'Perhaps the matter that seems to distress you "'is one that would more readily yield to our mutual efforts.' The young man looked up brightly at the prince. Brightly, but the perpendicular line of perplexity between his brows was not smoothed away. He laughed, and even then it did not. But he accepted the momentary diversion. "'Glad to meet you, prince,' he said good-humouredly. "'Yes, I'd say you were incog all right. Thanks for your offer of assistance. But I don't see where your butting in would help things any. It's a kind of private affair, you know.' but thanks all the same. Prince Michael sat at the young man's side. He was often rebuffed, but never offensively. His courteous manner and words forbade that. Clocks, said the prince, are shackles on the feet of mankind. I have observed you looking persistently at that clock. Its face is that of a tyrant. Its numbers are false as those on a lottery ticket. Its hands are those of a bunco steerer who makes an appointment with you to your ruin. Let me entreat you to throw off its humiliating bonds and to cease to order your affairs by that insensate monitor of brass and steel. I don't usually, said the young man. I carry a watch, except when I've got my radiant rags on. I know human nature as I do the trees and grass, said the prince, with earnest dignity. I am a master of philosophy, a graduate in art, and I hold the purse of a fortunatus. There are few mortal misfortunes that I cannot alleviate or overcome. I have read your countenance, and found in it honesty and nobility, as well as distress. I beg of you to accept my advice or aid. Do not belie the intelligence I see in your face, by judging from my appearance of my ability to defeat your troubles. The young man glanced at the clock again, and frowned darkly. When his gaze strayed from the glowing horologue of time, it rested intently upon a four-story red brick house in the row of dwellings opposite to where he sat. The shades were drawn, and the lights in many rooms shone dimly through them. Ten minutes to nine, exclaimed the young man, with an impatient gesture of despair. He turned his back upon the house, and took a rapid step or two in a contrary direction. Remain, commanded Prince Michael, in so potent a voice that the disturbed one wheeled around with a somewhat chagrined laugh. I'll give her the ten minutes, and then I'm off, he muttered, and then aloud to the prince, I'll join you in confounding all clocks, my friend, and throw in women, too. Sit down, said the prince calmly. I do not accept your addition. Women are the natural enemies of clocks, and therefore the allies of those who would seek liberation from these monsters that measure our follies and limit our pleasures. If you will so far confide in me, I would ask you to relate to me your story. The young man threw himself upon the bench with a reckless laugh. Your Royal Highness, I will, he said in tones of mock deference. Do you see yonder house, the one with three upper windows lighted? Well, at six o'clock I stood in that house with the young lady I am, that is, I was engaged to. I had been doing wrong, my dear prince. I had been a naughty boy, and she had heard of it. I wanted to be forgiven, of course. We are always wanting women to forgive us, aren't we, prince? I want time to think it over, said she. There is one thing certain. I will either fully forgive you, or I will never see your face again. There will be no halfway business. At half-past eight, she said, at exactly half-past eight, you may be watching the middle upper window of the top floor. If I decide to forgive, I will hang out of that window a white silk scarf. You will know by that that all is as it was before, and you may come to me. If you see no scarf, you may consider that everything between us is ended forever. That, concluded the young man bitterly, 
is why I have been watching that clock. The time for the signal to appear has passed twenty-three minutes ago. Do you wonder that I am a little disturbed, my prince of rags and whiskers? Let me repeat to you, said Prince Michael, in his even well-modulated tones, that women are the natural enemies of clocks. Clocks are an evil, women a blessing. The signal may yet appear. Never on your principality, exclaimed the young man hopelessly. You don't know Marion, of course. She's always on time, to the minute. That was the first thing about her that attracted me. I've got the mitten instead of the scarf. I ought to have known at 8.31 that my goose was cooked. I'll go west on the 11.45 tonight with Jack Milburn. The jig's up. I'll try Jack's ranch a while and top off with the Klondike and whiskey. Good night, er, er, Prince. Prince Michael smiled his enigmatic, gentle, comprehending smile and caught the coat sleeve of the other. The brilliant light in the prince's eyes was softening to a dreamier, cloudy translucence. Wait, he said solemnly, till the clock strikes. I have wealth and power and knowledge above most men, but when the clock strikes I am afraid. Stay by me until then. This woman shall be yours. You have the word of the hereditary prince of Vallaluna. On the day of your marriage I will give you one hundred thousand dollars and a place on the Hudson. But there must be no clocks in that palace. They measure our follies and limit our pleasures. Do you agree to that? Of course, said the young man cheerfully. They're a nuisance anyway, always ticking and striking and getting you late for dinner. He glanced again at the clock in the tower. The hands stood at three minutes to nine. I think, said Prince Michael, that I will sleep a little. The day has been fatiguing. He stretched himself upon a bench with the manner of one who has slept thus before. "'You will find me in this park on any evening when the weather is suitable,' said the prince sleepily. "'Come to me when your marriage day is set, and I will give you a check for the money.' "'Thanks, your highness,' said the young man seriously. "'It doesn't look as if I would need that palace on the Hudson, but I appreciate your offer just the same.' Prince Michael sank into deep slumber. His battered hat rolled from the bench to the ground. The young man lifted it, placed it over the frowsy face, and moved one of the grotesquely relaxed limbs into a more comfortable position. Poor devil, he said, as he drew the tattered clothes closer about the prince's breast. Sonorous and startling came the stroke of nine from the clock tower. The young man sighed again, turned his face for one last look at the house of his relinquished hopes and cried aloud profane words of holy rapture. From the middle upper window blossomed in the dusk a wavy, snowy, fluttering, wonderful, divine emblem of forgiveness and promised joy. By came a citizen, rotund, comfortable, home-hurrying, unknowing in the delights of waving silken scarves on the borders of dimly lit parks. "'Will you oblige me with the time, sir?' asked the young man and the citizen, shrewdly conjecturing his watch to be safe, dragged it out and announced, Twenty-nine and a half minutes past eight, sir. And then, from habit, he glanced at the clock in the tower, and made further oration. By George, that clock's half an hour fast. First time in ten years I've known it to be off. This watch of mine never varies a... But the citizen was talking to vacancy. He turned and saw his hearer, a fast-receding black shadow, flying in the direction of a house with three lighted upper windows. And in the morning came along two policemen, on their way to the beats they owned. The park was deserted, save for one dilapidated figure that sprawled asleep on a bench. They stopped and gazed upon it. "'It's dopey, Mike,' said one. "'He hits the pipe every night. Park bum for twenty years.' on his last legs, I guess. The other policeman stooped and looked at something crumpled and crisp in the hand of the sleeper. Gee, he remarked, he's doped out on a fifty-dollar bill anyway. Wish I knew the brand of hop that he smokes. And then rap, rap, rap went the club of realism against the shoe soles of Prince Michael of the electorate of Vallaluna. End of chapter 18 the Caliph, 
Cupid, and the clock. <laughs>